Hi, this is Misha. And in this video, we're going to revisit the M14E2, M14A1. This was the version of the M14 set up to supply squad automatic fire to be used as an LMG. And it saw quite a bit of use in Vietnam. We just did a video on the Grand and another one looking at the M14 compared to the BM-59. So it seemed time to revisit the E2. We did do an older video a few years ago on this. We were out shooting it and talked a bit about the history, but you know, it's worth revisiting. It's a unique gun. Now for the M14's history, check out the other videos. We're not going to go too much in, into the development in this one. But the original M14 was adopted in 1957 in the USA, and it was to be standard issue. It was an updated, modernized to some extent, M1 Garand, firing the 7.62 NATO cartridge. Originally, it was to be select fire, and it fed from detachable 20-round box mags, as well as could be topped off with stripper clips. It had a 22 inch barrel with a long flash hider on it and bayonet lug. These would go into production in 1959 and would first see combat in 1961, the M14 that is. The idea behind the gun was kind of a one-size-fits-all, jack-of-all-trades replacements. It was going to replace the M1 Garand, obviously. Also the M1 Carbine. The M3 Grease Gun, as well as the M1 Thompson, so the submachine guns in service at the time. And the 1918 BAR and the 1918A2, which was the LMG version of the BAR used in World War II in Korea. In the end, the M14 was more or less a dismal failure at this. It did replace the Garand. It replaced a few carbines, but beyond that, it wasn't really adequate to replace the M3 or the M1 submachine guns because it was just too large and heavy. And it was really too light to replace the 1918 BAR because in full auto, the original M14 was uncontrollable except maybe in the hands of someone who is extremely experienced with it in practice but for most soldiers who received a few weeks training no it wasn't in fact it was such an issue that most US military M14s had the selector switch removed and were blocked to semi only that said after it saw its combat debut they still needed a basically an LMG, a support weapon, a suppressing offensive fire weapon. They took a look at the M14. They also took a look at the M15, which was originally going to be the heavy barreled automatic version of the M14 before it was canceled in 1958. The M15 would have a bipod, it would have a heavier barrel, it would have a flip up butt plate and a few other things to, to make it better as a machine gun. They revisited that throughout 1961, 62, and into 63. The U.S. military would look into what they could do to the M14 to make it into a better weapon firing 308, 762 NATO, and automatic. And by 1964, they came up with the M14E2. Now, E is experimental. The E1 series was actually a bunch of folding stock guns, different styles of folding stock that never went into real production. They were never issued, so on and so forth. So that's where the E1 went to. The E2, though, was a conversion kit for the M14. So, starting at the muzzle, they have the original flash hider, of course, and over it, using the bayonet lug to clamp it on, we have a stabilizer. This turns the flash hider effectively into a muzzle brake, controlling recoil. Moving back to the gas block, we have an M2 bipod clamped to it. Now this M2 was originally designed primarily for the M15. It folds, it's made of stamped steel, 
It has adjustable legs with different notches positions. So it can it can go pretty tall or be pretty compact. We have a redesigned stock. Now this used the same blank as the M14 stock, but it was cut differently. We have a folding front grip. It's rubber coated. Has a release internally to fold it back up. Find good here on camera. There we go. It's interesting that this foregrip is adjustable. There are different holes in the bottom of the stock here. And so you can locate the grip further forward or further back. I've got it towards the back, but it can still go back a little bit further than it is right now. But it was an adjustable grip, which is neat. I mean, not in the field, obviously, but you could set it to the user. To match the front grip, we now have a rear pistol grip grafted on. It's this different piece put onto the stock. So a person can control it with both hands. We have a longer sling issued with dual clips, one for the foregrip, one for this front swivel here located on the bipod. There's also a second swivel here you could use if you wanted. Now the original M14 handguard was made of wood and it was ventilated. This was too weak. They went to a fiberglass ventilated handguard, which they went to a solid for the M14 soon after, but they would use the older ventilated handguard for the E2 to allow for better airflow over the barrel for faster cooling, because we're still using the standard M14 barrel. We have a standard receiver, of course, because we're converting. The E2 would not have the selector switch removed. It would remain here, full auto. Semi-auto. We would go flip this around. To a rear swivel that can rotate to the left side to get it out of the way. It's a rotating two position rear swivel. We would go to a different style of flip up butt plate from the M14 and we would go to a full rubber rubber recoil pad in the back. Also this stock is a more of a straight inline stock compared to the M14's. Kind of a similar profile to the later AR-50. And that was pretty much the the E2 conversion. I'm gonna drop my legs because they're getting in the way. The Army would order about 8,350 conversion kits in 1964 to pull some M14s out and turn them into E2s. Originally the project was going to be done by Winchester and TRW, but there were delays. So in the end the Springfield Armory ended up doing it. And these guns would be sent over to Vietnam for testing and to see how they did. Originally they were to provide automatic support for soldiers issued the M14 and then later, soon, soon after actually, they would be giving automatic support to soldiers issued with the early XM16E1s. Because of all the additions, this is a heavier rifle than the M14 and so when firing 30-06, excuse me, 308 7.62 NATO, in full auto, they did much better. Also thanks to the inline stock. Now we're still feeding from the standard 20 round M14 magazines. They never really came up with a 30 round mag for this. They just kept using the 20s because they worked. And this, since it has a fixed barrel, kept overheating from being a, a too large of an issue. It was still an issue, it's the suppressor fire gun. You know, the same problem that most light machine guns have.
But thanks to the inline stock, the pistol grip, the foregrip, and the weight of the bipod and the stabilizer, this gun is infinitely more controllable and semi-automatic and full automatic compared to the M14. In other words, it was a more successful LMG than the M14 would have been otherwise. And paired with the M16s, it actually was a, was a good combo. They, the two guns played well together. This gun could do suppressive fire, it had a big bark. The M16 could do more aimed single shot fire with its 5.56 to 23 NATO. And they worked well together in Vietnam. The military would order a couple of thousand more conversion kits, and in total about 10,000 M14 E2s would go to Vietnam. In 1966, this would be type classified and standardized as the M14A1. So the M14 E2, M14A1, same gun, one's just a standardization from 1966. So not a large number were ever made, but they did see quite a bit of use in Vietnam, even after the M14 itself was pulled out. The M14 a1 would continue to be used until the end of Vietnam. It's also worth noting that these stocks, at least the majority of them, were made by Canadian Arsenals Limited, formerly Long Branch, up in Canada for the U.S. I've always thought this was a neat gun. To this gun specifically, which is mine, we have a reproduction stabilizer made by Fulton. We have an original M2 bipod. This is one of the refurbished ones that Springfield sold off in the 80s. We have a military barrel, original handguard. We have one of the unissued stocks that came out a few years ago. We have original hardware. I still need to get the butt plate refinished. It's, most of the finish has gone on it, but uh, I'll get it reparked at one day. One day. Now the recoil pad back here is a modern reproduction by Treeline. The original one when I got it was just so hard and brittle I didn't want to use it. These reproductions are exactly like the originals and they work. They work great. Now oddly enough the rubber on this front grip is, uh, is fine but then again it has metal behind it so probably has a lot to do with it. Have an original mag in it. Have a fake selector switch again from Fulton. And we're built on a rewelded M14 receiver from Harrington and Richardson. So that's kind of neat that we're using a rewelded receiver. Kind of different. Of course, it's semi auto compliant and all that good stuff. And the rest of the parts are, are GI as well. While the, while the M14 series is not my favorite in the world, I really do like shooting the M14 E2A1. It's a really fun gun to shoot in semi-auto. Because of the extra weight, the recoil is negligible. Plus, you can just stick it on the bipod and use the front and rear grips to, to control it with. We'll move on. While we had the M14 E2 light machine gun version of the M14 out, I thought I'd be interesting to also bring out Beretta's equivalent for the BM-59. This is the BM-59 Mark IV, often called the Nigerian model. And this is the closest thing they really did to a, a squad automatic gun. Like the M14, this is based on the original BM-59, which in turn, like the M14, is based on the M1 Grand. We have an video comparing the base model M14 to the BM-59. So if you haven't watched that yet, you might want to before uh, continuing with this one just because uh, of where this goes. Whereas the M14 E2 used the original 22-inch barrel, general standard profile, the Mark IV used an extended 21-inch barrel which is a little bit heavier profile. It's not exponentially heavier, but the profile is heavier near the chamber and under the handguard area, just a, just a little bit. Essentially, the original guns had lightning cuts under here, and they, they withheld those lightning, lightning cuts. So it's a little heavier 
for sustained fire because the barrel is about an inch and a half longer. The gas system is also a little longer here, putting our bipod out a little further. These had the standard grenade sights and used the standard flash hiders. Some would use the five inch tri-compensator, some would use the seven. This has the seven on it with bayonet, lug, and grenade. The stock was borrowed from the BM59E2, excuse me, BM59 Mark II. We have a polymer pistol grip here with a winter trigger, which is correspondingly altered to work with the grip. It doesn't go back as far. We still feed from standard 20 round mags. Receiver is a standard modified Garand receiver. Like the M14E2, we have kind of a straight line inline stock. And we have a flip up butt plate. Now what's odd, it always struck me as odd about these, the way they did the butt plate, you really have to use a bullet tip to flip it up. I'm not sure what the uh, the thinking was there, but you need to get something underneath it to kind of get it going. Once it does, it's easy. So it also has a shoulder rest, although it's quite thin. Then we do have a rubber recoil pad with another storage compartment underneath. We also have a small storage compartment in the pistol grip. So there's some, some, some storage on board with the, uh, with the Mark IV. The M14E2 has no storage at all, not either in the stock or the grip. Solid. They issued it with a belt cleaning kit. Otherwise, the Mark IV is the same as other BM59s has the last round hold open pretty much straight in mags a little bit of rock to them there's not a lot known about the the Mark IV though Beretta would start offering this in their catalog in the late 60s it doesn't seem like many people purchase them and there are a few different versions if you look in the catalog some would have a different dedicated bipod but most that they would ship would use the standard BM59 bipod because it was sufficient. They would only make a few thousand I'm sure and it was really a combination of features from the BM59E with the longer barrel and the BM59 Mark II with the pistol grip stock. And like other BM59s, we have a lot more Garand style features and parts compared to the M14E2. Now this particular gun was built by Springfield. It's on one of the Italian forged but Springfield roll marked receivers from the 80s. We have an original Italian stock with Italian polymer grip. A lot of the ones you'll see will have a wooden grip. These would be US made grips, but they're still perfectly good. That's what Reese was shipping back then. Original Italian barrel and, and all that. It's like the other BM59 in my other video. It was assembled in the US in the 80s by Springfield but using Italian parts. I have this sling on the lower mount as opposed to the side. You can also mount it on the side like with the standard BM59. I just thought a, a bottom mount was kind of neat for this gun. Like the M14A1, the bipod just kind of folds up, adjustable, but on the other hand it is lighter. With the very recoil successful tri-compensator, this gun is also quite controllable and full automatic, even more so than the standard BM59. But it did not see much use. What small use it saw in military service was in Africa during the 70s and 80s. The M14A1 was definitely more successful in a military sense, seeing quite a bit of combat in Vietnam.
but yeah, I just always kind of like comparing these two guns because they they started off at the same point. It's just Italy, Beretta went a different route compared to the U.S. and Springfield. But um, I definitely find the M14A1 an interesting part of American history. And in a lot of ways, this LMG version was much more successful and much better suited for use in Vietnam than the standard M14 light rifle. At least this could be used in full automatic. Usually when you see people shooting guns like this that use them in service, they would use their offhand to kind of put above the barrel to keep it down. But um, the pistol grips really help on guns like this. That's why the FAL is comparatively more controllable in full auto, as is the G3. It's just uh, having a grip in the inline stock, straight stock, really just changes the recoil impulse and makes it more manageable. But yeah, so we'd revisit both of these. We have dedicated videos on the BM-59 as well as a couple on the M14. If you'd like to see more, please check those out. If you have any comments or questions, uh, please post them below. If you liked the video, please click like. And as always, if you haven't subscribed, we'd really appreciate it if you could do so when you find the time. It helps us out a lot. This is Misha. And please tune in again soon for more hopefully interesting videos next time.